This is a supplemental video with more information about random variables. The probability model for a random variable distributes the total probability over the outcome set. In the case of a discrete random variable, the model is given by a probability mass function. It gives the probability of each outcome in the outcome set. For example, if we roll two dice and record the largest value that is facing up on the two dice and call that our random variable x, we can display the probability mass function graphically like this. Each probability model has a mean. For discrete random variables, the way that we find the mean is we take each value in the outcome set, multiply it by its associated probability, and add them all up. So for instance, in our example, the first outcome in our outcome set is 1. The probability that the largest value is equal to 1 is 1 over 36. So I multiply those together, then I come and I add. The next value is 2 times the probability that x equals 2 is 3 over 36. Next value in the outcome set is 3 with probability 5 over 36 and so on until I've made my way through all of the outcomes in the outcome set. When I add those all up, it gives me the mean. In addition, each probability model has a variance that describes how much variation there is in the outcomes. For discrete random variables, to find the variance, it's very similar to what we did when we were thinking about variance being the difference between the values in a data set and the mean squared, and we sort of averaged them out. Except now instead of averaging them out, we're weighting them based on their probabilities. So we take each outcome in the outcome set, subtract the mean from it, take that deviation and square it, and then multiply by the probability of that particular outcome. So for example, for the outcome 1, we take 1 minus the mean, which was 4.472. We square that difference and multiply by the probability that x equals 1. Then we go on to the next value in the data set. 2 minus 4.472. Take that deviation, square it, and multiply by the probability that x equals 2. And we continue on through x equals 3, 4, 5, and 6 and add all of those values together and get a variance of approximately 1.97. Okay, now it's time for you to try one. Stop the video for a minute and try calculating the mean and variance of the random variable z. Start the recording back up when you're finished. Here's the solution so that you can check your work. Probability models also distribute the total probability over the outcome set for continuous random variables, but they do it slightly differently. For continuous random variables, instead of a probability mass function, there's a probability density function, f of x, which is a smooth curve that gives the density of probability around each value x, but is not equal to the probability that x takes on that value. Instead, because there are infinitely many possible values in a tiny, tiny interval, the probability that x takes on any exact value is zero for all values of x, even the ones that are in the outcome set that can occur. The area under the density function between two values a and b is used to find the probability that the random variable x takes a value in that range. So for example, if we're looking at the time to the next call, having an exponential distribution with lambda equal 0.25, that gives us a density curve that looks like this. And if I wanted to find the probability that the time until the next call is more than three minutes, say, I could find the area under this curve shaded to purple to the right of 3. 
and that would represent the probability that the time till the next call is greater than three minutes. We can also find the mean for continuous random variables. Instead of summing over a discrete set of possible outcomes, we integrate over the entire outcome space the random variable x times f of x, which was that probability density function that we just looked like. So for example, for the exponential distribution with lambda equals 0 0.25, the function that gives the probability density is 0 0.25 e to the minus 0 0.25 x. If we integrate over the outcome space, which goes from zero to infinity, because we're looking for the time to an event, x times this probability density function, we find that the mean time until the next event is four. And similarly, for a continuous random variable, we can calculate the variance by integrating a similar function where I take the deviations from the mean squared and multiply it by the probability density function this time. You can see that for this exponential distribution with lambda equal 0.25, the variance is equal to 16. Now, I don't want to get bogged down in the calculus of doing these kinds of calculations. I mostly just want to give you a little bit of a sense of how discrete and continuous random variables differ from each other. Um, but also help you recognize that we can graph probability models, both discrete and continuous, that we can think about their shape and that we can also calculate their sort of typical value or expected value, which is the mean, and give an idea of how much variation we'd expect to see from that typical value using the variance. Now we've seen the, um, some of the common probability models and the mean and the variance for those common probability models can be expressed in terms of their model parameters. And I just sort of put these up here so you can see how the, that can be done. Um, just want to kind of mention that, you know, these probability models, we did not go through the process of deriving them or working with them a whole lot. Um, that is something that probably a lot of you have seen in some of your other courses. But if that's something you're interested in, we're not going to have a chance to do much with that this semester. But if you haven't taken STAT 151 or 251, if you're a graduate student, those courses would derive these distributions, their probability density and probability mass functions, and actually derive the mean and the variance formulas also. I'm going to take just a second to talk about the idea of independence between two random variables. Um, two events or random variables are independent when knowing the outcome of one does not change the probability of the outcomes for the second. So, for example, if I flip a coin twice, if I let X be a one if the first flip lands with heads facing up and a zero if the first flip lands with tails facing up, I'll let Y equal one if the second flip lands with heads facing up and zero if the second flip lands with tails facing up. And I'll let Z be the total number of heads in the two flips. Now X and Y are independent because there's no reason to believe that what happens in the first flip of a coin is going to somehow influence what happens in the second flip. So those are independent events. On the other hand, X and Z are not independent. Because before I flip the coin once, I know I have three possible outcomes for Z. I could have zero heads, one head, or two heads in, in the two coin flips. But once I flip the first, first coin, if X is equal to one, then I know I have at least one heads. And now Z, the number of heads, can't take the value zero anymore. On the other hand, if x is zero and I have a tail on the first flip, then I know that it's not possible for z to equal two anymore. So x and z are not independent, they are dependent. Similarly, y and z would also be dependent or not independent. We can also find the mean and the variance of a linear combination of 
independent random variables. If X and Y are two independent random variables and A and B are numerical constants, then A times X plus B times Y is a linear combination of X and Y. The mean of the linear combination AX plus BY is equal to A times the mean of X plus B times the mean of Y. And the variance of AX plus BY is equal to A squared times the variance of X plus B squared times the variance of Y. Let's look at an example using a linear combination. A convenience store will buy a randomly selected three pound bag of apples and a randomly selected three pound bag of oranges. They plan to sell the fruit by the piece, charging 75 cents per apple and $1.25 per orange. So A is a random variable, which is the number of apples in the randomly selected bag. And that random variable has a mean of 11 and a variance of five. R is the number of oranges per bag, and that has a mean of 9 and a variance of 3. So if we consider T the total selling price for all of the fruit in a randomly selected bag of apples and a randomly selected bag of oranges, the total selling price, T, is going to be $0.75 cents or $0.75 times the number of apples, A, plus 1.25 dollars times the number of oranges r which means that the mean of t is equal to 0.75 times the mean of a which is 11 plus 1.25 times the mean of r which is 9 which gives us a mean of $19.50. So on average, if this convenience store randomly selects a three pound bag of apples and a three pound bag of oranges and sells the fruit using these prices, this would be the total revenue if they sell all the fruit on average. Now the variance of T is going to be 0.75 squared times the variance of A plus 1.25 squared times the variance of R. That gives us 0.75 squared times five plus 1.25 squared times three for a total of $7.5 dollars squared is the variance. Remember variance is always in squared units compared to the original units of your variable. Okay, so here's one for you to try. Pause the tape and try working through this example. We have the number of candies in a regular size bag of M&Ms has a mean of 38 and variance of five. The number of candies in a regular size bag of Skittles has mean 53 and variance seven. Sam, Morgan, and Alex are gonna buy one bag of M&Ms and one bag of Skittles, both regular size. Sam only likes Skittles and is gonna eat two thirds of the candies in the bag of the Skittles. Morgan only likes M&Ms and will eat two thirds of the candies in the bag of M&Ms. And Alex likes both candies and is gonna end up eating one third of the M&Ms and one third of the Skittles. What are the mean and the variance for the number of candies that each friend is going to eat? Stop the tape, give it a try, and then go ahead to the next slide and check your answer. Here's the solution so that you can check your work. If you find you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. And you can also bring questions to our meeting on Thursday. Between now and Thursday, please complete the practice exercises, which you'll find in the course materials. Work on the homework, and then come to the live meeting with questions. Talk to you Thursday.